If I described a rifle to you that used box magazines, if it was semi-automatic, if it was also chambered in a intermediate cartridge and perhaps even had a full auto fire selector, what kind of rifle would you think of? Maybe a modern M4 or an AK platform rifle? What if I told you that the rifle I'm describing is over a hundred years old and actually saw limited service in World War I? Today guys, in this episode of Backyard Battlefield, we're going to take a look at the Winchester model of 1907. Despite its usually semi-auto configuration, this rifle was known as one of the first assault rifles. This rifle is going to be very familiar to any of you guys that have played either Battlefield 1 or Battlefield 5. The features on this rifle are kind of a precursor to weapons that would be much more common in World War II. If you guys are familiar with the M1 carbine, this is kind of its uh, older brother, if you will, and shares a lot of those same features. In this video, we're going to imagine an alternate history of World War I, much like Battlefield I did, where the war has continued and the Americans have to come up with their own stormtrooper trench fighting tactics, much like the Germans did near the end of the war. And we're going to see how a rifle like this, a semi-automatic, box magazine fed, easy to handle small rifle, would have performed in trench warfare. Because I think if the war had continued, this might have been a bit of history that we actually would have seen. possible loadout for a uh, perhaps American style stormtrooper soldier would have been a little bit different than just a trench fighting soldier. Instead of just bolt action rifles, you probably have the rifle we're going to be focusing on today, the Winchester model of 1907. This would be a, a very likely choice for close quarters trench combat because the Winchester was already in use by France and would have definitely been available for soldiers on the American side to use as well. For this kind of uh, perhaps alternate history style loadout, again inspired by Battlefield 1 and Battlefield 5, wrappings like this were not uncommon, but this one in particular might be a little bit much as it does cover your rear sight. But if you're in a trench just point shooting, the additional heat protection for rapid fire might have actually been worth losing those rear sights, but we're just gonna use it for a couple of shots. I do have the 10 round magazine already good to go here with a few extras right here in my ammo pouch here on the stock. And of course a uh, leather sling so that in case of my rifle running dry, I don't have time to uh, reload it, or perhaps I'm out of magazines, I can, instead of just tossing it down, I can uh, sling it and then draw my pistol, which is a 45 caliber model of 1911. This one's a bit more modern, uh, but I already had it, so we're gonna use it for the loadout today. Let's take a look at how the actual trench combat would have possibly worked for the Americans if the war had continued and how the shooting would have gone. American stormtrooper tactics probably would have followed the German model. The first step was getting your squad very, very close to the enemy positions. You would sneak in as low and quiet as possible and wait for a very focused and intense artillery barrage. The idea being, once that intense artillery stopped, you and your squad with your rapid fire close quarters combat weapons would be very, very close to the enemy trenches. Once the artillery was over, you dive into the trench and you just push through. You don't take it, you just want to clear it out for the infantry coming up behind you.
and we're out. So this is the scenario where magazines are gone. It's time to sling the rifle and draw the pistol. I'm not gonna drop my mag now. And there you have it guys, this is the possible loadout that might have actually been used had World War I continued by American style uh, stormtrooper troops. Semi-automatic, heavy hitting American pistol and a intermediate caliber semi-automatic rifle which to my pleasant surprise here, it's actually really easy to point shoot this thing. Again, with this kind of fun wrapping I was trying out just for my immersion purposes, you really can't see the rear sight but this rifle it's so soft shooting that you really can just point shoot and go pretty quickly. It's a lot of fun. I've heard the power of the 351 Winchester cartridge compared to the power of an AK-47 cartridge in 7.62x39. And in my opinion, it's actually a bit softer shooting than even that. We'll talk more about the ammo shortly, but as far as just felt recoil goes, perhaps it's the weight of the rifle or the fact that a lot of the weight on the rifle is so far forward towards the forearm and the muzzle, but I actually found it really, really pleasant to shoot. And again, it is really intuitive to just point shoot. Every single one of those quickly aimed shots without the rear sight hit my targets at about 10 to 20 yards depending on which target I was shooting at. And even when running and shooting, almost every single shot hit the target. Don't let my terrible GoPro mount here fool you. The recoil on this rifle really is not that bad. Let's take a look at some more aim shots and see how many we can get on target at a slightly longer range. Let's take a closer look at the Winchester model of 1907 and see what some of the main features are. This is a not so great aftermarket 10 round magazine because the originals cost around uh, 250 bucks and I was not paying that on top of what I paid for the rifle. So it's not great quality but with some adjustments you can make them work relatively well and we had some good luck with our first run with this magazine and had no malfunctions at least at first. Uh, but yeah, these original 10 rounders are incredibly expensive. I can't imagine how much the 15s or 20s would cost. Terrifying to think about. You guys can see the default five rounder right there. And I actually think that uh, the five rounder looks really good on the rifle. It has almost a art deco feel to it. Gives the rifle a really sleek profile. But the five rounder would have been the default for say a hunting configuration, or just what you would see coming straight from the factory. The 10 rounders, as well as the 15s, and possibly even higher like 20 round magazines, which would have been absolutely huge, those were more common for military and police applications. You guys can see the mag release right there. And this is honestly a super awkward mag release design. It's so stiff. The factory mag comes out pretty easy, but you have to press and pull at the same time. And really that's just a, a two-handed job. It's uh, kind of awkward. Mm. 
the full model number for the Winchester had an SL at the end, which stood for self-loading. You guys can see the breech right here. And there's the follower of the magazine, which would feed the rounds up into the chamber. This was still very new technology in 1907. The bolt is also very, very heavy. I've heard up to two pounds. And it's to hold it in place so that once a cartridge is fired, the bullet has time to travel all the way out the muzzle before the breech opens to load the next round. So that's a huge chunk of steel right there, right in the middle of this rifle. It's pretty hefty, close to eight pounds for a rifle this small. I mean, it's not very big at all, but it weighs a decent amount. Now, a lot of that weight, even with so much right there in the chamber, is here in the forearm, which makes the rifle a little bit front heavy, but also makes it pretty easy to shoot. The muzzle really does not jump at all. That brings us to the charging pump, which uh, I think goes down in history, guys, as one of the most unergonomic and most awkward charging methods I've ever seen for a rifle. Once you load your magazine in, you've got to reach forward towards the muzzle and get your fingers up under the barrel, which could be hot if you've been shooting it, and press down with probably like eight to 10 pounds of force. And you guys can see there, it digs into your fingers. This one right here is a 1912 manufacturer, so even before World War I, and it has just a super awkward plunger design. It's just flat. You have to get your fingers up under there and just tear them up. It has a little bit of texture on the edge to help grip, but that's about it. In the 1930s, a slight little scoop shape would be added to the plunger to help your finger kind of rest in a more natural location so you'd have less awkward pressure for pushing that, but uh, yeah. Super, super awkward to charge this rifle. And uh, surprisingly enough, not a design you're gonna see anywhere else for obvious reasons. As far as the front sight goes, it's just a simple, according to the label here, number two bead sight. You can imagine it's uh, much like a shotgun's bead sight with just a little piece of brass there on the end. That definitely feels like some old school World War I technology right there. Just that little brass bead on the front. The rear sight is very interesting. It's just a very open, adjustable rear sight. You can pull it up like that and then slide it back and forth like that to adjust the height of the rear sight. Really neat looking design. And if you guys, again, have ever played Battlefield 1 or Battlefield 5, you're going to instantly recognize this rear sight profile. It's uh, one of the most unique looking rear sights in any of those games. Very, very recognizable. The safety is what I call a BB gun style safety, just a simple push button. And like a lot of things that were designed back in the early 1900s, safety is not a priority even on the safety. It has zero markings to tell you which one is safe. Let's find out. Rifle is clear. So that is not safety. So right side push button is safety. Who designs a safety and decides, we don't need markings, it's fine. Not great. The trigger though is uh, interesting. It's not bad. It's single stage, no creep, but pretty heavy. Uh, I honestly, I like it. It's not bad. Yeah, a lot of resistance, but uh, pretty straightforward. Or I guess straight back. <laughs> Trigger jokes. <laughs> there is a suggestion that some of these might have actually been converted for full auto fire uh, by especially the French, but the paper trail isn't super clear and it's not clear if they were actually uh, ever really converted or if that is uh, just one of those internet legends. The knob here on the back is actually a takedown knob. You just unscrew it to the left and then work the charging pump and the rifle explodes apart. Very odd takedown method. I guess you wouldn't have to use this in the trenches. You can access the chamber for basic cleaning by just uh, twisting the charging uh, knob right there. Uh, after depressing it, you press it and then twist. It'll lock into place. But if you wanted to do a full takedown, yeah, unscrew the knob, pump the full handle, and the rifle explodes apart. Very odd and kind of unnerving method of, uh, of takedown. It's got some very cool Winchester trademark markings here on the back. 
It just feels like a, uh, a really neat old school rifle, even with all of the more modern style features. Speaking of modern features, here on the back of the stock, something you won't see on very many World War I rifles, there's a plastic uh, buttstock cap there on the end. Still has the old school Winchester trademark logo. But yeah, this was one of the first rifles that uh, was issued a plastic stock, I believe. And trust me, it makes a difference compared to the M95, for example, which enjoys bruising your shoulder by adding that uh, metal buttstock plate there on the end. The stock itself is, I believe, walnut, I want to say, and has uh, a very, very thin profile and a very slight pistol grip shape to it. Honestly, this rifle, even with the almost eight pounds weight, has such a comfortable grip to it. Uh, it is just really, really pleasant to hold and shoot, <laughs> which they had to ruin with that awful pump charging system. What a shame, right? This rifle is probably one of the early production hunting models and is missing a couple of slightly more common military and police features, including uh, there's no sling loops on this one and I didn't want to uh, drill sling loops into a rifle that's actually over 100 years old. I wanted to keep it as original as possible. So I got a uh, brass stacker sling loop, which just wraps right around the stock. It's designed for Winchester rifles so that you can have a sling on your rifle without making any kind of permanent modifications to it. It's designed to go around the magazine tube of a lever action, but it worked okay with just a clamp on the, uh, the barrel here at least for some filming that we did with it, uh, so I could have a sling. Additionally, the military and police models would generally have a bayonet for the military. That's a pretty obvious application, but you also think about it. It was pretty common back in the day for police to use bayonets for crowd control. So yeah, guys, be real thankful for tear gas and tasers today. At least you're not facing down state police bayonets on the end of a Winchester. Let's talk about the cartridge, 351 Winchester, and this rifle right here is the only one to ever actually use it. So they stopped making this ammo in, I believe, the 1960s. And right now, if you want a vintage box of 351, it's gonna run you about $3 a round. In a blowback design like this rifle uses, the bigger the cartridge, the bigger the bolt and recoil spring has to be to counter the explosion of the cartridge firing to delay the blowback action of the weapon. If this cartridge were much bigger, it would have to have a much larger bolt. Gas operated and piston operated weapons would definitely be the way to go going forward. All that being said, the cartridge is powerful enough on its own to be used both in combat and as a hunting cartridge. I have heard of people taking deer with these rifles and they were very popular for about 50 years or so as hunting rifles, even outside of their military and police applications. And of course, in case you guys couldn't tell, I do love history and I also love the design of these vintage ammo boxes. Just definitely wash your hands after handling with those exposed lead tips. I'll also mention here that I was really impressed with how well this ammo performed. These boxes are probably, who knows, 40 to 60 years old, and every cartridge of this vintage ammo that we fired functioned flawlessly, although they were a little bit sparky. It's hard to say if that's the ammo, or just the fact that this rifle has no kind of flash hider or muzzle brake, though. Now that we've gone back in time a bit to look at this rifle as it might have been used in trench warfare, let's take it out to the range and see how actually accurate it is on paper. We've already seen it's pretty accurate for some fast shooting. Let's go out and do some slightly slower shooting as well. We had a very cold and wet night out here at the range and I haven't modified that 10 round magazine to fix the follower issues. So we're gonna stick to the five rounder for our group testing for the most part here. Our paper target is at roughly 60 yards with a 10 inch gong there at 100. I'm gonna put one towards the gong just to see what happens. Mm -hmm. 
Nothing happened. Yeah, not sure where it hit. Like a lot of rifles of this time period, especially ones that had military applications, the sights tend to be zeroed a little bit high by default. I'm also not sure what applications my rifle was used in before I got my hands on it, so it's definitely shooting a bit high, but not bad for a first group. As you guys can see, when fully loaded, the 10 round magazine is still binding up on the follower there. Loading 7 or 8 will allow you to get 5 or 6 shots off, but for the most part, I'm going to retire this magazine until I do some modifications to it. Eight appears to be the magic number. Heard that brass tingle. Three dollars. <laughs> This brass is making no sense too, it's flying all over the place. Alright, going for the gun. There it is. Nice shot, Dave. You got I it. It was a little low and a little left on the gun, maybe? Yeah, but your pattern was a little like that to begin with. I'll just cut out the four times that I missed it after this, and then the six times that I had other people miss for me. Unknown. At 100 yards, our sights were definitely zeroed a bit high. The good news is, our second group was much, much tighter. It's looking really good here for accuracy. I will take the blame for that right-sided drift though. Our lighting conditions weren't great, and I was having a hard time getting that front sight on target, but still, a pretty solid group there. So yeah, you were still way high. Okay, so the shot that I thought went low, it might have just been the dirt exploding yeah. over the target. It was probably still too high. Yep. And to wrap things up for the accuracy testing, I wanted to do some rapid fire from the resting position and then let Joel take a couple of shots as well. $3. How much? Three. Per round. Yeah, that's uh, $3 <laughs> a round? Yeah, I really appreciate you guys reminding me of that constantly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't miss. Just, just before you said I could shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the red dot means recording, right, Joel? What's that? <laughs> do you have those on? I'm trying to do three. You just can't load and talk at the same time, then. No, I was, I was sneaking an extra bullet. <laughs> Oh, you got away with it too. <laughs> I, just, I just did two. Okay. That one just goes straight in. It's really odd. There's no rock to it. Yeah, okay. Yep. <laughs> it like grabs your skin. Yeah. This rifle's a dick. Although Joel also wasn't able to hit the gong, I was once again pleasantly surprised to see that all four of my rapid fire shots are all on target. The group has opened up quite a bit, but with how fast I was firing, I am really happy with that. I think if I had those original factory 10 or 15 or 20 round magazines, the ability to have fast and accurate fire from this rifle would be a huge advantage on a battlefield. Let's go ahead and hop into Battlefield 1 and look at some of the trench combat in that game with this rifle in a fully automatic variant that inspired this video. Here in Battlefield 1, the low magazine capacity default starting Winchester 1907 is not great just because you're gonna be outclassed by a lot of the other guns in the game, but the higher capacity magazine models are great choices. And there's also the trench sweeper version, which has that full auto modification that again, we're not really clear if it ever actually happened, but it's definitely a possibility that those were converted, at least a handful of them were. Of course, in real life, these rifles were generally used by air forces, and there's no record of them actually being used in trench combat, but as I think I've demonstrated, it definitely could have held its own. As usual, DICE has done a great job of making this weapon animate and look correct, and it's a lot of fun to use in-game. In Battlefield 5, this is actually one of the primary assault rifles used by the assault class, and I think the sound effects and animations are somehow even better. There's a great amount of texture detail on the receiver, and even the wear markings on the magazine are on the correct locations where the magazine would rub against the receiver as it was being changed out. 
Battlefield 5's automatic fire rate might be a little bit high though. According to militaryfactory.com, the automatic conversions were supposedly around 700 rounds per minute. Again though, DICE has just done a great job at capturing the feel of this firearm in the game, even if it is the automatic version. You can swap over to single shot, at which point this weapon does look true to life. And just check out the magazine change sounds. It is 100% on point. I hope you guys have enjoyed this historical episode of the Backyard Battlefield with the Winchester 1907. Special thanks to Joel for filming. Hi behind the camera, Joel. You can find uh, Joel's website at normanthefilm.com where he has a full length feature film coming out uh, in the relatively near future. It's heading on down the pipes as you were. It's coming, right Joel? Mm -hmm. Okay. And also a big thanks to uh, Ben over at Knapsack Creative for helping out with some of the camera work for this episode. Make sure you guys subscribe if you want to see more videos like this, and don't forget to like the video if you enjoyed it. I'll see you guys next time.